Good evening, everybody, and uh, you're very welcome to the latest in our series of webinars, uh, which are really now developing into a season of virtual tutorials in which we're able to share with you um, the work of our uh, tutorial fellows and in which uh, we can all enjoy asking all the questions that we uh, want to ask about uh, their areas of expertise. And um, so far in this series, we've achieved a fantastic level, I think, of uh, intimacy and interaction, um, al almost like being in a tutorial. And um, I'm hoping that we will have the same experience uh, this evening. Uh, this evening, I'm really happy to welcome Rahul Santanam, who is a professor of computing science and tutorial fellow at Maudlin. And Rahul's particular interests include algorithms and complexity theory. Uh, he is working on the boundaries between computer science, maths, philosophy, and ethics uh, in ways that are at once highly theoretical and that have enormous practical implications for the ways in which we live our daily lives. And I think we're just starting to realize the extent to which computer algorithms uh, have an enormous impact on many, many aspects of our lives. So uh, Rahul is going to be posing some big questions for us today. Uh, his title uh, is Through the Computational Lens, Sudoku, the Game of Life and the Nature of the Universe. Um, the way we're going to do it is that Rahul will speak for about 35 minutes, then uh, we're going to open it up for questions and discussion. Uh, I know some of you will have done this before. Uh, you'll see at the bottom of your screens, there is a Q&A button. Uh, any questions you want to ask, please use the Q&A button, and I will then put the questions to Rahul after he's spoken. So uh, Rahul's going to share his screen now, and without any more ado, uh, over to you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dinah. Um, hopefully everyone's able to see uh, my slides now. Um, yes, so um, my plan for this talk is um, to try to um, illustrate the power of uh, computational thinking um, by um, taking um, uh, simple games like Sudoku and the game of life as um, uh, starting points on a journey towards the deepest truths of our universe. Um, so I'm um, a computer scientist here at Modlin. Um, I've been here since 2016, um, so five years now. Um, and computer science itself is a field um, that's existed only for the past 50 years. Um, now Modlin is about 10 times as old as that. It's, it's more than 500 years old. Um, so computer science is rather a newcomer. And I think for many of you um, alumni, um, computer science might not have been a subject that was in Maudlin at the time that you were here. Um, so I'm gonna start off by asking the question, what is computer science good for? Um, uh, I'm curious um, how you think of computer science, what, what comes into your mind when you think of computer science? Um, and I can sort of give you my view, um, what kinds of things come to my mind when um, I think of computer science? Well, perhaps the first aspect that comes to mind is that computers are amazing tools. They allow us to do amazing things. So here's um, a picture of a humanoid robot, the now robot, which is used in experiments. And um, robots are sort of um, a quintessential symbol of, of computing and its power. Um, we can send robots out to do difficult and dangerous things that humans don't want to do, um, like space exploration or cl cleaning radioactive waste, things like that. Um, or medical interventions, um, which um, are too sort of risky for a human to do. So robots are very useful to us. So the second picture here is of a chess board. Um, so chess has long been sort of the province of humans. Um, it's a sign of our intelligence that we, are, that we are good at chess, so can be very good at chess. But that picture has really changed in recent years. And um, the, the, the greatest chess players now are algorithms. And in fact, um, the British company DeepMind, um, their, um, their recent program Alpha Zero, um, learned how to play chess um, between breakfast and lunch on a single day and beat the best chess, chess playing program that day. Um, not just the best human, but the best chess playing program. So 
computers algorithms are making these amazing strides at playing chess and we can't keep up with them anymore um so the third um sort of um uh, uh, image here is is of a quote um the meaning of life is to create the illusion of possibility for those that lack visibility um and you might wonder who the quote is from and it's actually from an artificial intelligence um from this really cool um new text generation system called gpt3 which humans can interact with and which can um create create uh, kind of new pieces of text um by uh, it's you have like older piece of text fed into it and it creates novel combinations from them so computers now seemingly are able to do philosophy or at least what passes as philosophy so these are the kinds of things that you read in the good news section of our newspapers all the amazing things that computers can do um and then um there's uh, the flip side um so uh um there's donald trump um and his um um becoming president of the us and that owed a lot to um computers and changes they've made in our world computers change our world in ways um that we couldn't have predicted and that we aren't prepared for um so the very sort of nature of democracy is sort of compromised by um social media by twitter by facebook um and um we still don't properly understand what kinds of effects these have the picture on the right you might not recognize or be very surprised to recognize because this is the the photograph of a person who doesn't exist um i got this this photo from the website this person does not exist.com which is a website where artificial intelligences um are fed pictures of human faces and they create new plausible feature uh, human faces new plausible photographs of faces of people who don't exist and this is one such face um and this of course creates all kinds of issues because we tend to trust faces um perhaps a company could use um um a kind of a manufactured face um to to show that they're that they're being diverse um perhaps um on online you have something being sold to you um by someone with a certain face uh, someone who doesn't exist um perhaps on social media there's someone with a face that looks very trustworthy who spouts falsehoods um I mean as human beings we have the capacity to be rational but we don't always have a guard up there are some things that we're very inclined to do such as socializing um such as um kind of uh, connecting to faces and trusting them and um algorithms artificial intelligences could exploit these vulnerabilities um so th there's sort of notes of caution here and this too is often in the newspapers all the threats the risks um that computers and algorithms can pose and the caution that we need to exercise but there's yet a third dimension um and this is a dimension that i'm going to be focusing on during my talk computers help us understand our world um so the first picture here is a picture of the universe um and um what does it have to do with computers well not much if you think of the computer as your laptop or your phone but if you think of computers more broadly as systems that store and process information then um their reach expands um the universe um is a computer in this sense uh, perhaps a computer whose software is the laws of physics and um it can kind of runs producing new configurations and we like to predict what happens to the universe similarly the human brain is a computer where the neurons encode state and the state evolves um and in fact there are computational metaphors that are very useful in understanding the brain and this third picture here is of william shakespeare and i'm wondering why william shakespeare is on this slide Well the previous webinar was given by Laurie Maguire um a fellow in English here uh, on Shakespeare's work and it turns out that computers and algorithms are also very relevant to the humanities to understanding the past to understanding the literature um if we want to prove that Shakespeare's works were not written by the earl of oxford perhaps the strongest evidence for it could be given by computational analysis rather than any article written by a human being so computational understanding helps towards the humanities as well so all of these are ways in which computers help us understand our world um and the reason i'm going to be focusing on this in my talk is firstly that i think it's somewhat under appreciated or under emphasized in comparison to the other two dimensions perhaps it's not as newsworthy but it's just as important and also it ties in quite closely to my own work um and to my own interests so in the q and a i'm very happy to take questions on any of these three dimensions or anything else about computer science but um 
questions about this aspect of computer science will perhaps be the ones on which I can give the most informed answers. Okay, now we can um, begin with the games. Um, so first of all, Sudoku. Um, so um, many of you I'm sure have seen Sudoku before, but for those of you who haven't, Sudoku is a one player game, um, which consists of a, a grid of cells um, on which numbers are written. So it's quite often a nine cross nine grid. And you have numbers from one to nine written here. So, and, and the task is to fill in all the blanks with numbers from one to nine, so that various constraints are satisfied. Every row has a numbers one to nine each exactly once. Every column of this big square has a numbers one to nine exactly once. And also every little square here, every three cross three square has a numbers one to nine exactly once. And Sudoku originated in Japan, but it's, um, it's spread uh, worldwide and it's a very, very popular um, sort of puzzle um, and yeah, occupies quite a lot of uh, um, human beings computational power, I believe. Um, this particular Sudoku puzzle is fairly simple. Um, so um, how do you go about solving it? Where, um, well, if you look at this top leftmost square here, um, which are the numbers that are missing from it? Um, well, six, four, and seven. And we know that the number four occurs in the first column of this big square here. So um, it certainly can't occur in either this square or on this one because it already occurs in this column. So the four will have to go into this um, blank square here. Um, what's left are six and seven. We know there's a seven in this row. So the seven will have to be here and the six will be here. And similarly, we have various constraints which we can use to fill in um, squares of, uh, of the Sudoku board. Um, and, and really the, it's, it's a question of identifying which cells are the most promising ones to work with first. But this is a fairly easy puzzle in the scheme of things. This puzzle here is much harder. Um, there are fewer numbers filled in, so there are fewer constraints. And since there are fewer constraints, um, it's, um, that there's fewer options that you can rule out. So it might be that there's some guesswork that's required when trying to solve this puzzle. Um, perhaps um, you just sort of try uh, placing a two here and then see what other constraints it leads to. It might be that this guess is just completely wrong and you'll need to backtrack and try something else there. Um, so the fact that fewer spaces are filled makes this puzzle somewhat harder. And then there are Sudoku puzzles that are harder yet. Um, so the Sudoku puzzles I showed you before um, were nine cross nine squares, but you could imagine a 16 cross 16 square or in general, an n squared cross n squared um, grid um, where any, n is any number, um, where the rules are similar, except that these subsquares are larger too. And you need to fill in um, the, the, the squares with numbers so that each number occurs exactly once in a row, a column, and in the smaller square. Um, so the fact that the puzzle has gotten bigger makes this problem harder and more challenging. But one of the interesting things about Sudoku is that we want it to be hard. Um, we um, actually uh, prefer Sudoku to be hard. We prefer to be challenged. Um, and um, so this sort of raises an interesting question. Um, um, is it true that Sudoku is hard? Is Sudoku inherently hard? Or might there be a simple method for solving it? Well, our experience is that Sudoku is hard. Um, there are puzzles that we might solve, but then there are other puzzles which, which are hard for us. And we might train ourselves on those, but then there are puzzles that are harder still, and so on. Um, so it seems like there's a hierarchy of hardness here and that it's always possible to produce hard puzzles which we cannot solve. Um, but is this really the case? How would one even phrase or frame the question? What does it mean for Sudoku to be inherently hard? Clearly one doesn't mean hard for a specific person because the person's level of skill could vary. There needs to be a more objective notion of what hardness is. And here's a possible um, sort of um, notion. The question of whether there's a systematic method for solving Sudoku quickly. Is there a sequence of instructions which given a board you can, you can go through, unambiguous instructions, which tell you how to reason, how to place numbers in cells, maybe how to um, guess and then kind of ver verify your guess in a way that allows you to eventually solve the Sudoku puzzle um, before not too long. Um, and this is kind of a way of framing the question where guesswork intuition don't play a role. Um, it's all about being sure that you're gonna get a solution in the end. And not a solution to any specific puzzle, but a solution to the game in general. I mean, one way you could do this is by trying all possibilities. You could try every combination of the numbers one to nine and all squares. 
But this is, is just um, going to be very, very hard because there's an exponential number of possibilities. So in general, this would take longer than the age of the universe to do. So this isn't a reasonable way to do it. So um, let's think about kind of like what feature of Sudoku might possibly make it easy. Well, one feature that Sudoku has is that any candidate solution can be efficiently checked. Um, if I fill in these squares with numbers, I can easily check whether the constraints are satisfied. Is it true that each column has the numbers one to 16 exactly once? Is it true that every row has the numbers one to 16 exactly once in each subsquare? These are conditions that are very easy to check. So any kind of candidate solution, any way of filling in the squares can be checked for correctness easily. And such problems are called NP problems. Um, so the term NP here stands for non-intermistic polynomial time. I know it's a mouthful and those of us who try to popularize Computer science are always frustrated by this, but there's not much we can do at this point. Um, it's a definition that goes way back to the, uh, to the 70s. So Sudoku is an NP problem. It's a problem where any candidate solution can be efficiently checked. But what we're interested in is whether Sudoku can be solved efficiently. Is it true that there is a very efficient way to produce a solution? And problems where the solution can be produced efficiently for example, uh, the problem of adding two numbers or multiplying two numbers, we know how to do that very quickly. Such problems are called P problems, problems in P for polynomial time. And now um, there's sort of a broader question one can ask, the NP versus P question. The NP versus P question asks, can every problem with efficiently checkable solutions also be solved efficiently? So Sudoku is an example of a problem with an efficiently checkable solution. And we asked whether Sudoku can be solved efficiently. But in general, you can ask this for every problem that has efficiently checkable solutions. Now, this, um, the answer seems like it should be no, right? It's, it's unclear how you do much better than, than brute force guessing, just trying all possibilities. And that takes an exponential amount of time. So intuitively, it seems like the answer should be no, but we don't know any proof of this so far. And it's one of the most important open questions in all of mathematics. Um, it's one of the seven clay millennium problems, the clay mathematical institute proposed to the turn of the millennium, seven problems which to them were of fundamental importance, each with a $1 million prize for solving the problem. And one of these problems of Poincare conjecture has already been solved, but the other six problems remain. And P versus NP is one of them. So for um, any of you out there who are sort of like, um, maybe in high school and kind of interested in math and computer science, um, perhaps uh, this is sort of an opportunity to read more about the problem to see whether it interests you. Um, there's a story about Andrew Wiles, uh, the, a mathematician at Oxford, that when he was 10 years old, um, he read about Fermat's Last Theorem, um, a sort of mathematical problem um, posed in the 17th century by Pierre de Fermat, um, a problem with a very simple statement, but to which no solution was known. And he grew obsessed with this problem, and um, he decided that he would work on it when he was a mathematician as an adult. And he ended up working on it and solving it. Um, and now the Mathematical Institute at Oxford is named after him and Andrew Wiles himself works in the Andrew Wiles building, which must be quite strange. Um, but I think these kinds of kind of attachments to problems um, can, can arise at the right time for it is when um, you're still in high school um, or quite early on in your career. And it seems like NP versus P is a problem that won't be solved anytime soon. So for those of you who sort of inclined that way, I encourage you to, um, to maybe spend some of your time thinking about it. Um, so the original question we asked was about Sudoku, not about NP versus P, because Sudoku is a specific problem in NP. So might it not be that Sudoku itself is efficiently solvable, even if NP not equal to P? There might be other NP problems which are not in P, which are not efficiently solvable, but perhaps Sudoku itself is efficiently solvable. And somewhat amazingly, um, the answer to this is no. Um, Sudoku is the hardest problem in NP. Um, if you can come up with a procedure for solving Sudoku efficiently, then NP equals P. Every problem in NP can be solved efficiently. And this sounds amazing at first, right? And inc it's, it's incredible because Sudoku is this puzzle that we kind of came up with. Um, and um, why should it be so special that it's the hardest problem in NP? Well, it turns out that Sudoku isn't unique in this respect. There are many, many natural problems, NP problems, which are each the hardest problem in NP in the sense that they capture all the hardness of NP. If you can solve any of them quickly, you can solve all the others quickly. These problems include map coloring, the problem of given a map, can you color it with three colors so that every neighbor, two neighboring territories get different colors? That's the map coloring problem. There's a change making problem. You're given coins of various denominations and um, you're asked, well, here's an amount I want to make with these coins. Is it possible to make that amount? Um, so these are both problems which can be checked efficiently. Given a coloring, you can check if it's the correct coloring. 
given a set of coins, you can check if they add to a specific amount. But the problem is in actually finding the right set of coins and finding the right assignment of colors. Similarly, there's a problem called largest clique, which also has this property. These are all NP-complete problems. And NP-completeness seems a very widespread phenomenon. And Sudoku, um, the puzzle that we started off with, is another example of an NP-complete problem. So, um, so that's about Sudoku. But um, I'd like you to um, think a little bit about world where NP equals P, right? I said earlier that it's unlikely that, um, that NP equals P. It's unlikely that we can do better than brute force search when we're solving NP problems. Um, but it seems like a mathematical question, a question of uh, interest mostly to mathematicians. Is it of interest to the wider world? And I'd like to argue that it is. And um, in order to do that, just imagine a world where NP equals P, where every problem that has efficiently che checkable solutions can also be solved efficiently. Uh, I claim that there are all kinds of strange counterintuitive phenomena that happen in that world. Machines can learn perfectly. You'd have perfect language comprehension and translation because to check whether something is a correct translation is easy, but finding the correct translation is often hard. You'll have optimized scientific discovery and drug design. Um, for a scientist, what they want to do is to create a theory that fits, fits the facts. And in a world where NP equals P, you can create the, the smallest theory, the most efficient theory that fits the facts you can create the most optimal drugs. So these examples are the first dimension of computer science that I spoke about earlier, computers as a tool. But there are also new threats, new uncertainties that will arise. Security and privacy will disappear completely. Um, we rely on secure mechanisms to transmit information over the internet. All of these will be broken because it's easily verifiable whether a password is correct or not. You just type in the password and see whether it works. Um, if you can also find passwords efficiently, which would follow from NP equals P, then you can break everyone's password. There won't be any secure information transmission anymore. So this might not be such a good thing. And perhaps even more counterintuitively, I would cl I claim that creativity can be automated. On demand, an algorithm can be um, designed that presents to you a novel text or poem or some other text that matches your aesthetic criteria. So you'll have an endless supply of, um, of text without ever having to be produced by humans. And um, most problematically for my own case, mathematicians will be made redundant because computers will be much better at maths than we are. Um, what mathematicians do mostly is try to find proofs for theorems. Um, proofs are easy to check, but they're very hard to produce. That's why you need mathematicians to, to, to produce them. Um, if NP were equal to P, then proofs would be as easy to produce as to check. And that would mean that mathematicians wouldn't be required anymore. Um, so all of these um, are, well, are features that aren't present in our world yet, which might lead us to believe that NP doesn't equal P, but that doesn't constitute a proof. It's maybe just an indication. And it just shows that the NP versus P problem is actually closely tied to what happens in our world, in our computational world. So that's all I'm going to say for now about Sudoku and NP versus P. But um, now I'm going to talk about uh, the game of life, about Conway's game of life. So um, Sudoku is a one player game, right? It's a game that's played by one person trying to solve a certain puzzle. Now Conway's Game of Life, which was um, created by John Horton Conway, mathematical genius at um, Princeton and at Cambridge, um, who's, who's also an extraordinary character actually, who is sort of completely obsessed with games, with kind of creating them, with playing them, with mathematically analyzing them. But he was also a serious mathematician. He just saw no difference at all between working with games, play, playing games, and doing mathematics. Um, and I think some of the best science, some of the best artists of that form, where there's no real distinction between art, uh, between play and work. Um, so Conway is an example of this, um, the, the creator of this game. So Conway's Game of Life, this is a zero person game, um, which it doesn't need any players at all. It's a game that sort of plays itself. And you might think this isn't very interesting, but you would be surprised. Um, how do you play Conway's Game of Life? Or how does Conway's Game of Life play itself? Well, um, like Sudoku, it's on a grid of square cells. But while Sudoku is played on a finite grid, Conway's Game of Life is played on an infinite two-dimensional grid of square cells. So notice that any infinite, um, that the infinite two-dimensional grid, has, for each cell has eight neighbors, right? There's north, south, east, west, northwest, northeast, southwest, southeast, a cell in each of these directions. Those are the neighbors of a cell. And the way that Conway's Game of Life begins is that there's an initial configuration. Each cell has one of two states, alive or dead. And there's a finite number of cells that are marked live, and the rest are dead at the beginning. And then 
the, the grid evolves according to a very simple set of rules. And it's captured by these two um, statements here. At each step in time, synchronously in a coordinated way, a live cell continues to be live if it has two or three live neighbors. Um, if it has one live neighbor, then it dies from underpopulation. If it has four or more live neighbors, it dies from overpopulation. But two or three is just right and it survives. Um, a dead cell comes alive if it has three live neighbors. Three live neighbors creates a form of reproduction and it causes a dead cell to come alive. So this happens simultaneously. So time is discrete and at each step in time, a cell, if it's alive, continues to be alive in the next step if it has two or three live neighbors. A dead cell becomes alive if it has three live neighbors and stays dead otherwise. So notice that this is a deterministic process. Each configuration kind of leads to a unique next configuration. And the question is, what kinds of patterns arise in this game um, given the initial configuration? Like clearly, Everything is encoded into the initial configuration. Given the initial configuration, the game just progresses by itself. But what can happen in this game? And all kinds of interesting things can happen. So there are still lives, life forms that are still, that never evolve. An example of that is the hat. Here's the hat. Um, and why is it the hat doesn't evolve? Well, um, here, what does a black cell mean? A black cell means a cell that's alive. A white cell is a cell that's dead. And let's just check um, using the rules of Conway's game of life that dead cells remain dead and live cells remain alive. So, so recall the rules. A live cell continues to be alive if it has two or three live neighbors. A dead cell only comes alive if it has three live neighbors and stays dead otherwise. It's not too hard to check that every black square here, every cell that's live has exactly two or three black neighbors. So it has exactly two or three live neighbors. So it continues to be live in the next step. Well, every white cell, there's no white cell that has three neighbors. Um, cells have either zero, one, two, or at least four neighbors. There's no white cell with, with three neighbors. Hence, no dead cell becomes alive. So cells remain in their state for all eternity, and hence the still life, the hat. There are some more interesting con configurations. There's oscillators. Um, these are sequences of configurations that repeat. So here's one that's called the clock. There's a sort of very colorful terminology. There's a whole community of people who are interested in the game of life and explore what kinds of patterns happen in it. Um, it's well worth checking out online. There's various simulators and websites devoted to this. Um, and it's quite fascinating. I mean, it's, it's almost like a world that builds up around this game. So here's the clock. Um, so this sort of um, intuitively feels like um, the swinging of a pendulum. It's, it, it's a pattern with period two. It just cycles between these two configurations over and over again. Here's a more poetic oscillating configuration, the heart. So um, this is a, a configuration with period five. Um, it, it evolves and then it kind of gets back to this initial configuration and then it begins again. Um, but it always stays in the same place and it's under oscillator um, called the heart. And there are more interesting configurations than these. Um, there's the glider. So the configurations we've seen so far basically stay put. Um, they either stay still, they might flicker or oscillate, but they basically stay in one place. The glider moves um, and it's more like life in this uh, respect. It's a life form with locomotion. It kind of translates itself diagonally through the infinite grid um, and continues doing so at a constant rate. It's called a spaceship. A spaceship is a configuration that translates itself through the grid rather than staying put. And the game of life with its very simple rules can still lead to um, uh, to such interesting behaviors, to the glider. And more interesting behaviors still, the Gosper glider gun. Um, this is a configuration that manufactures gliders. It's like a glider factory. Um, these gliders are manufactured and uh, are produced diagonally, kind of exiting the screen um, and going off into eternity. And this just happens over and over again. All the configurations we saw so far, um, there's only kind of a bounded number of live cells at any point in time. Uh, the number of live cells doesn't increase. But here, there's a potentially unbounded number of live cells because these gliders keep getting created over and over again. And now you can see um, kind of part of the reason why the game has the name that it has, right? The game of life, because it's um, like a simulation of an environment where organisms, communities of organisms evolve. Like you can think of these as life forms almost. And um, they're born, they grow, they die. So. Um, it's sort of like a very kind of rich simulation environment, despite the simplicity of the rules. 
And in fact, this is the reason why Conway originally came up with it because he was interested in the question of artificial life. Is there an artificial setting in which you can kind of create forms that display the characteristics of life? Um, and something like the Gosper glider gun seems quite close to doing so. And in fact, there are even more complicated mechanisms which can reproduce themselves. They can create whole copies of themselves. And that's a lot more like life. So um, I'm not quite sure what the meaning of life is. The expert on that is probably Monty Python, but I can tell you something about the meaning of the game of life. Um, why is the game of life interesting? I've already given you some, uh, some reasons. Um, um, well, there's kind of the motivation from biology, trying to understand why say life can, ar can arise or something like life can arise from very simple conditions. The game of life provides an environment to study this. But it also tells us something about complexity as a simplicity. It shows us that a great degree of complexity can arise from very simple rules. And uh, the behavior of the game of life has by no means been exhausted. Um, there are constantly new behaviors being discovered. And this is from rules that are extremely simple. Cells are in one of two states, live or dead, that's it. And this, the way they change is very local. How a cell state changes depends only on the states of its neighbors and on nothing else. And moreover, it only depends on the number of live or dead neighbors. Um, it seems like one of the simplest games possible without being completely trivial. And yet it shows this incredibly rich behavior. So I say complexity can arise and I've kind of given you some visual evidence of it, but there's actually more formal ways of saying that this is the case. Um, the game of life is actually universal. It can simulate any computer program. Um, so it's incredibly powerful and it's kind of like complexity. And what do I mean by this? What does it mean for me to say that it can simulate any computer program? Well, you can think of a computer program to be like some piece of text. And you can imagine a dictionary that translates between pieces of text and patterns on the grid. So you can translate each piece of text, each program into a pattern on the grid and you supply it to the game of life. And then the game of life runs, it evolves. And what you get at the end is a pattern that represents the answer to the computer program. So the game of life is capable of running any computer program. You can think of it as a very simple, but extremely powerful computer, as powerful as any computer that we have in principle. And that leads to sort of questions that are kind of somewhere in the boundary between philosophy and physics. Perhaps the universe itself is like a similar game with simple rules. Uh, it's an extraordinary fact that so many of the laws of nature, the laws, Newton's laws, or the laws of electromagnetism, um, or even the laws of physics that have been discovered in the 20th century, though they're somewhat more complicated, they're still quite simple in essence. And um, um, you might wonder why this is, how is it that the, lo the laws of nature are so simple while what we observe in the universe is so complex? Well, the game of life provides an environment where you can see how this can happen. And perhaps the universe itself is like the game of life, a simple a game with very simple rules. And the task of physics is to somehow discover these rules. Um, it's quite speculative, of course, but I think there are these kind of incredible deep connections between physics and computation that we need to understand better. And this brings me back actually to Sudoku, um, to the NP versus P problem, because um, it's sort of like, um, suggests these connections between NP problems and physical reality. Um, I suggested in the previous slide that the universe itself is a computer, the universe itself is computational. But if that's the case, if the universe is computational, then that means that limits in computation and what we can do computationally translates to limits on what can be done in our physical world, right? Um, so the NP versus P problem, NP not equals P, this is what we believe. That's a mathematical conjecture. Um, it seems like something to be studied mathematically, but it has a physical meaning as well. Um, the physical meaning is that no physical process, no process in the real world can solve problems like Sudoku efficiently. And here we think of a Sudoku problem as somehow encoded or represented in the real world. And some kind of machine, we are free to kind of use the laws of physics in any way we, we wish to create a machine that solves Sudoku. And um, somehow we want NP versus P to capture our observed sort of um, empirical data that it doesn't seem that any physical process can do this. And at various points in time, there have been conjectures that, that physical systems can solve NP complete problems, like soap bubbles can find minimum energy configurations, which lead to um, kind of essentially solving NP problems efficiently. But all of these claims turn out to be false. It, terms, it seems that the physical world is inherently limited in its capacity to do things, similar to the computational world. And that should suggest all these deep links between physics and computation. Physics and computer science are intimately related because they both seek to describe, predict, and understand our world. Um, and, and just to kind of like finish off and kind of like uh, maybe on the kind of intriguing note, quantum computing, which some of you might've heard of, 
is another example of this close connection, right? So um, the computers that we build, the computers that we use are based on the laws of classical physics. But perhaps, um, well, the, the laws of physics, there's strong indications that they're really quantum, not classical. Can we exploit this to solve computational problems faster? That's the subject of a completely different talk. It'll take me much longer time to describe that. Um, but, but I think it's a good way to, to end. Thank you. Thank you, that was absolutely fascinating. Um, do you want to unshare your screen again? So we're back on the, thank you, thank you very much. Um, you finished off by uh, addressing the question of quantum computing, um, which you said is, is using the laws of quantum physics to build computers. I, I mean, that, that sounds amazing to me, but I don't understand what it means. Could, what, what does it mean? Okay, so um, the game of life, so um, that's sort of a situation where um, the configuration changes locally, right? So like e the state of each cell depends only on the neighbors around it. Um, but quantum mechanics indicates that the way that um, the world works is that um, there's non-local changes, like the state of um, a system can change depending on uh, the state of things that are very far from it. And there's certain laws that describe that. So you can try to bring those laws into how you build a computer and try to kind of build a computer that exploits those laws. And that's what quantum computing seeks to do. Um, but as of now, it's still an idea. I mean, there've been various experiments about it, but it's still quite speculative. Um, I mean, it's an extraordinary idea and there's like a rich theory around it, um, but there isn't um, kind of practical quantum computers yet. Um, but there's all kinds of sort of possible applications that we've already kind of imagined for them. So we, we were asked a question before uh, the, the webinar began, which is what, what are the implications of, of quantum computing in the financial world? Is that, is that a possible application? How would that affect, uh, say, you know, tr trading in advanced uh, financial instruments? Yeah, it's a possible application. I mean, I should say that at this point in time, quantum computing is I mean, a fascinating idea, but it's not clear how close it is to reality. I mean, it's, it's a lot of companies, a lot of governments are betting on it being pretty close to reality. They're investing a lot of money in quantum computing. And it's true that the technology is improving, but there's no guarantee that we'll ever get a completely fault tolerant quantum computer. But if we do, there will certainly be consequences. So we know, for example, that um, quantum computers can uh, have a, like a speed up over classical computers. Um, like if you want to search a list with, N, with 100 elements in it, um, a classical computer needs 100 steps to do that quantum computer can do it in 10 steps. So that's like a quadratic speed up. And these kinds of, um, uh, of gains in efficiency could be useful in finance because when you're doing things like automated trading, where there's algorithms trying to trade, um, using quantum hardware could kind of significantly speed up what you're doing and allow mm -hmm. you to gain advantages. So uh, yeah, but basically, but you just then, I guess you just get an arms race. Yes, exactly. I mean, it's already an arms race. I mean, there are all these algorithms yeah. trying to use the best hardware, um, and, and, and making the, cable, the stock market optimizing more optimizing the cable. Oh, sorry. Oh, there, there was. I remember a piece about how they they optimize the fiber optic cable to give them the uh, very small speed advantage uh, when trading. Yeah, which translates to a massive advantage in in their winnings. Mm -hmm. um, we've been asked a question by Tim, who's eleven, um, uh, asking about the. Uh, one of the seven millennial problems that was solved. Mm -hmm. Did they use computers to solve it? Ah, oh, that's a great question. Um, so um, in fact, um, they didn't, uh, to the best of my knowledge. So the, the, this is a Poincaré conjecture, which was solved by um, Grigory Perelman, a reclusive Russian mathematician, who turned out wasn't interested in the prize at all and refused to accept it. He was doing it because he loved mathematics and he just thought that it was an important problem to solve. Um, he hated all the publicity surrounding it, everything that came with it. Um, so, um, and kind of an incredibly original solution. Um, it was kind of very celebrated. It's possible that for many of the problems that com computers might um, become involved in the solution, at least in kind of checking small cases, it's certainly part of the toolbox of mathematicians now. Um, and it leads to problems of its own because when you use computers, checking a proof becomes more complicated. You use computers, how do you know that you've used them correctly and that um, yeah, it proves become more complicated to check, but it's certainly a part of the toolbox of mathematicians now, and it might be useful in the solution of other millennia problems, including- I'm, I'm, I'm imagining a world where the computer thinks it's solved the millennium, the millennial problem. 
So and that's a, the, yeah. the operator can't tell if it has or hasn't. Well, so actually the NPU is free problem has this interesting feature. If NP equals free, then um, like a computer can produce a solution to it probably better than a human can. We couldn't, we might not be able to understand the computer's solution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's a, that's a case with a lot of our interactions with computers now, right? The lack of explainability. Computers kind of do things which are claimed to be good for us, but um, there's a lack of justification as to why they're good. Um, Is that the moment of, at which we should become very scared? Yes, yeah, I think so. I mean, I think there's, um, <laughs> there's more of an awareness now and there's more of a sort of work on explainability on kind of like re tracing responsibility for the kinds of things that algorithms do uh, for the way that, um, for example, the A-level results got messed up uh, last mm -hmm. year. Um, like where do you trace back responsibility? Um, yeah, what kind of system do you have for accountability there? Uh, I think these are very, very interesting questions and important ones as algorithms become more and more uh, widely used. I mean, we, we're all familiar with, um, you know, I mean, obviously, I, I had to grapple personally with the um, disaster of the A-level results last summer, where, where the algorithm had the effect of systematically downgrading uh, students from um, disadvantaged backgrounds on the basis of the average results of their schools. Um, but biases in algorithms are now increasingly a problem. I mean, I, I saw a thing a couple of days ago uh, about Facebook saying that the Facebook algorithm doesn't offer the same employment advertising to women that it offers to men. Um, and surprising. there have been issues with the Twitter algorithm not focusing on black faces, but only on white faces. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I, I just wonder how, how if, you're, if you're in the computer science world, how do you police the biases of your algorithms when the computers are learning uh, all the time and are basically soaking up the information from our biased world and translating that into decision-making? How do you eradicate the bias from the algorithm? Yeah, I mean, it's a very challenging issue because it's not necessarily the case that the humans um, who put in the data into the computers have these biases of these rules, have mm -hmm. these biases too. The biases might just be very, very hard to the discover systemic. and predict. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the and the computer, as I understand it, the com the computers teach themselves on the basis of experience. Mm -hmm. They have the ability to get to, to to engage in many 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 transactions every second, and thereby gain a huge amount of. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one possibility is to just insist on trial periods when you're deploying something. Um, kind of like have a trial period where you can kind of check whether their biases have become apparent or not. Um, I mean, of course, we are not willing to wait. We live in impatient times, and uh, mm -hmm. that's not such a popular solution, perhaps. Um, an excellent question here from Dave Morris. Uh, given that your field has applications to genetics, economics, the environment, literary analysis, maybe even particle physics, are you frustrated that it's saddled with the name computer science? Absolutely. I mean, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, it, it's just hard to think of a name that would capture all of these connections and kind of like do justice to the field and the, the multidisciplinary sort of nature that it has. Um, and yeah, there's a great list of, um, of fields that the computer science and computation is related to. I mean, like saying computing science, informatics, perhaps is a bit better because the focus isn't so much on the physical objects that computers are, but just on the process. How is it, how do you store, kind of represent process information? That's really what it's about. Um, so com science of computation, computing science, informatics are probably better terms, but I don't think any of them um, are ideal. I mean, I, I think that particularly for, for people of my generation who are not digital natives, um, the, the term computer science conjures up for us the, the misery of our youth in these terrible kind of um, computer labs at school with these enormous hulking machines with people learning to write basic. And that's what I, I think that's the image that people my age have in their heads when you say computer science, they go, oh God, I've run a mile. But, but, but if, if you realize that actually it's, it's philosophy and it's, um, physics and it's maths, it, it's a complete, it's a, it's a world that's, I think, you know, almost unknown to many of us and yet completely fascinating. Yeah, and I think if this, this, these aspects are emphasized more when it's taught at school, I mean, that might mm -hmm. um, make it more inclusive. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's kind of a problem with computer science too, that is not necessarily the most inclusive field. So Jimmy Anderson says, does your perspective on the potential for computation leave you optimistic or pessimistic for the human condition? Um, well, um, 
it, it, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a bit of both. Um, I mean, I, I guess what one judges based on is what's happening now, right? And, um, and, and what the situation is like now. And um, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of optimism about very targeted applications, like applications in medicine, um, kind of like applications to solve a very specific problem. The concerns are more about like the implications of, of certain algorithms and kind of studying societal issues. And I, I think it, it's happening more now. I think earlier computer science wasn't really kind of aware of these, um, of these kinds of effects and how to study them. But hopefully by kind of more interaction with um, political science, sociology, with the other fields, um, there will be a better understanding of these things. Um, but there is always the issue that like there's incentives to develop an algorithm that's effective and um, the understanding of what kinds of biases or issues we might have always lags behind. So there's always gonna be that issue. Um, that, yeah, that doesn't mean we should stifle innovation completely, but we certainly should be more cautious than we are now, I think, and um, yeah. I mean, it strikes me, it's not just a, a question about biases, but also about the enormous potential of computing developments to lead to unintended or unforeseen consequences. Yeah, in fact, that's inherent in the nature of computation. I mean, uh, it's, it's a theorem of computer science that you can't predict what a computer will do, like say 100 steps from now without running a computer for 100 steps. So that's just kind of inherent in the discipline itself. That is, that is quite worrying when, when you're looking at um, things like, you know, the development of Twitter and other kinds of social media and the effect that that's had on the way that people consume news. Because if, if you have uh, an algorithm that only feeds you the news that confirms the biases you already have on the basis of the news you've previously been reading. Mm -hmm. You get these extraordinary bubbles developing where some people have fed uh, a diet of a particular liberal progressive viewpoint, others have fed a diet of um, hard right conspiracy theories. Mm -hmm. um, and does yeah, that part of, yeah, yeah. Lead, seems to lead to extremism. I mean, part of the problem is that we have a this tendency. Mm -hmm. We have this image of computer science as a very precise discipline, right? I mean, computer programs are extremely precise. So it's, it's all very black and white, very categorical. But um, of course, when you use computer science in the real world, there are all kinds of subliminal emotional aspects to it. And these are aspects that um, the computer scientists have never been used to kind of studying. In fact, um, there might be a selection bias in computer scientists that they're more inclined to see the world in black and white. So they're especially... Um, poorly equipped to be studying these kinds of aspects of computing. So you're actually saying that, that computer science is too complicated to be dealt with by computer scientists. Absolutely. Yeah. Which may be an ultimate NP not equal to P problem. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of version of it perhaps. Yeah. Um, Marilyn Booth says, hi Rahul and thanks. Yeah, hi Marilyn. How are computers going to participate in our urgent need to heal the world from our impending ecological disaster? For anyone who doesn't know, uh, Marilyn is herself a, a fellow of Morgan. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I think, um, so this too is going to require like a significant conversation between people who work in computer science and those who work on, on the environment, environmental economics, on policymakers and so forth. Um, so uh, I think, I mean, it's really like the biggest obstacles are um, at the political level um, to, to, to bring this kind of change about. Um, I mean, at the technical level, in terms of the kinds of competition we have, I mean, those are kind of the easiest problems to solve. And we made so much progress along those lines. It's really the more the, pro the, the problems at a societal level, at a policy level, that are kind of stopping us from, uh, from addressing these issues. How far are computers themselves part of the ecological problem, just from the amount of energy that they consume? Yeah. So that's, to think about that's, that. that. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a great question. I think, yeah, I think there's, that there's, um, there's some truths to that, though. Um, perhaps not as much as some other factors, but they certainly do play a role. And there has been some work on um, trying to get computers that are energy efficient, but it turns out there's kind of like an inherent trade-off between energy consumption and speed. So that um, mm. like the less energy you consume, that means that your computer gets slower. Um, so, and uh, yeah, I mean, of course we want to solve problems quickly. We're not, uh, we're quite willing to spend a lot of energy now if it's going to get us quick results. Um, so it's really about kind of like, I mean, there are all these situations where kind of our selfish um, kind of um, choice is going to be bad for the planet and where kind of a coordinated sort of solution is necessary, but it's quite hard to incentivize the solutions. Um, how do setters, this is, sorry, this is Edmund Marshall. How do setters of Sudoku problems make sure that their problems have unique solutions? 
Oh, that's um, that's a great question. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm not that I'm not completely sure how they do that. Um, uh, there is sort of like I think there are algorithms that that create problems with with unique solutions. I mean, one way would be to kind of start off with like a, a kind of random assignment to the board that satisfies these solutions, and then um, kind of remove some some numbers. But of course, you can't be guaranteed that there's no other way of completing that board. Um, so um, yeah, I mean that's a very good question. Actually, not quite sure how that's done, but um, yeah, it is a challenge in practice. Okay, this is probably the sixty-four thousand dollar question. In fact, the million dollar question from Ken. Um, can you give some insight into how one might prove that NP is not equal to P? Yeah, with great difficulty. How do you do yeah. that? <laughs> so the, I, I think we have a much better understanding of what makes NP versus P a difficult problem. So. There are all kinds of barriers we have identified. We're very good at identifying barriers to solving the problem, not so much at making progress on it. And in fact, um, the, the longer we go, the, the less we know about the problem in a way. We realize the extent of our ignorance about it. So in a way, we're almost kind of regressing. Um, and it's just that the problem is so kind of like incredibly powerful. It captures, it has relevance to so many different things. It has so many dimensions to it. It's hard to know like what kind of approach will take into account all of these possible implications. Um, so possibly like um, you need to use uh, like lots of different parts of mathematics. We need to develop new connections within mathematics to do that. Um, there are very few kind of real kind of plausible approaches to NP versus P and, and even those approaches seem a very long way off from, from solving it. Um, but I, I think for now, all we can do is trying to kind of understand computation better more broadly, like identifying NP complete problem as the structure of computation. And then hopefully that will give us some clues about how to tackle the problem in the future. So you think trying to, to delineate the scope of the problem is, is the most we can do at the moment? That's a huge challenge, yeah, the NPL speed, because yeah. it just seems so kind of, uh, yeah, multidimensional in scope. Yeah. Um, Ma Marilyn Booth again is saying, as a literary translator, I don't want to think that computers can produce or convey literary text as well. Uh, what do you think? Well, I mean, I would hope not. I mean, I love literature too, and I would hope not. Yeah. But um, yeah, uh, but technology progresses at an extraordinary rate. So this quote that I showed you by this um, this kind of language generator called GPT-3, that's kind of an, a new language generator. It still needs quite a bit of interaction with humans in order to produce kind of um, interesting pieces of text. So the way it goes is that like um, you give it some hints, then it, it, it creates some sentences following that. You either accept or reject them. If you reject them, it produces on the candidate set. And so on, and so you can kind of create a quite plausible text um, in that way. Um, I mean, I would think that the way that we relate to text um, has something to do with kind of the human experience that went behind it um, in ways that are still hard to model by computers, and that will continue to be the case for a while. Um, but of course, it's quite hard to um, discuss that in a precise way. I mean, that's just an intuition. Yeah, you mean the, the particular types of language choice that we find satisfying? Yes. It's quite hard to translate into any kind of algorithm. It's not just that. It's also that um, when we kind of look at a literary text, we are always thinking of it contextually. We're thinking of it in the context of our life experience, of our reading experience. There's a lot of invisible information that's being brought to bear mm -hmm. uh, in its relevance. Um, Which the computer and... hasn't got access to. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, we, we tend to think of translation tools as the incredibly crude Google Translate with I mean, I, d I don't know to what extent there are really sophisticated translation tools available now and how good they are. But well, I don't think they're much more sophisticated than Google Translate, but Google Translate does kind of a reasonable job for kind of um, functional language, I would say. Um, it just doesn't do great for literary text. No, well, it sometimes doesn't do great for grammar either. <laughs> and Emily Tan says, it is interesting that Conway's game of life deals both at the level of the cell and at the level of the pattern. The thing that they have in common are the rules of death and life. One of the things that indicates life from a, a completely different perspective is the error in reproduction. Is that possible or conceivable in this context? Um, so uh, I didn't catch the last part, what, the what about reproduction? Um, is is the, the error in reproduction. Yeah, so... Um... Yeah, so yeah, so the game of life is still, I mean, it's like a toy model, very, very simple. So there's lots of um, subtleties, nuances that aren't captured by it. But uh, I think what's extraordinary about it is how much it does manage to capture these very simple rules. So um, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, the question is right. Yeah, it doesn't capture the error. Um, 
and perhaps a more complicated model could, but um, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting that there's already all this rich behavior that's possible with these simple rules. So that means you effectively can't get mutations. Y yeah, yeah, there's no, there's no um, easy way to get mutations. So if you want to simulate evolution, I mean, there's other computational processes that do that, but um, the game of life itself is too simple to do that. Um, mm -hmm. But there's other models for how evolution works. Um, yeah, um, one of the most famous computer scientists, Les Valiant, has like these, these models of evolution. And uh, one of his main questions is, um, how do you, comp how do you um, model evolution as a computational concept so that we can understand um, how it's progressed to the point it has now? Is that something that we can model and understand using the, through the computational lens? That's one of the I major wonder, research projects. I mean, is that something that would be useful in, in trying to predict the mutation of viruses? Um, so epidemiology, I would guess, does use computational techniques too. But um, some of these mutations are random. So um, um, I guess the way you do that is by introducing some randomness into your model. Keith Johnson says, if, if quantum computers can break all current cryptography and they also allow us to create new methods, can, sorry, will they also allow us to create new methods which they cannot break? On the great question, yeah, yeah. So uh, I don't think it's quite true that quantum computers can break all known cryptography. They can certainly break crypto systems that are based on factoring, such as the RSA crypto system, but there's other crypto systems um, such as uh, like lattice-based ones where it's not clear as yet. But um, yeah, I mean, quantum computers can also be used to kind of do cryptography because um, they're a great way of producing pure randomness. I mean, you have like a quantum state as a superposition of two states and then you, you measure it and that creates a random bit. Um, and so it's also a way to generate randomness, which is again useful in, um, in transmitting information and encoding information. So yeah, there, there definitely is kind of like more possibilities that open up in terms of encoding information as well, not just in breaking it in, into codes. Another great question here. Um, if algorithms pick up human biases, can they be used to diagnose unconscious biases and then be used to uh, correct them? Yeah, I mean, the key point the word here is unconscious, right? So, um, I mean, to in, in some sense, computers only um, kind of um, have behavior that been kind of, so all the behavior is a consequence of what's being fed into them. Um, so if these biases are kind of completely unconscious, how would you sort of like diagnose them and how do you um, sort of get the computer to recognize them? I mean, uh, yeah, in principle, you could do that. You could say, well, here's this, this data, it looks like, it's doing very differently on, on women than with men or with kind of uh, based on ethnicity and, um, and computers could then try to try to diagnose what they're doing wrong. Um, so that's, yeah, to use computational tools and diagnosing biases is certainly an important approach. We can't hope to do it just as humans. I mean, because computational behavior is too difficult for us to understand as humans. Is there any software available which can be used to prove programs correct? To do it by hand appears to be difficult. Um, yeah, so that's absolutely right. Uh, on the great question, yeah, you um, doing it by hand is very difficult, and there are tools um, for software verification where um, you kind of like essentially say, well, the program, this part of the program is doing what it's supposed to do, and then you kind of like um, make sure that um, various parts of the program, the way they communicate with each other in the right ways, um, and so there's a whole kind of field of computer science, program verification, and program testing that's devoted to that. Yes. This is a question from Meg Axworthy, who's 15. Uh, she says, do you think it should be more important for schools to teach computer science in the future as it becomes more influential in our world? Yes, absolutely. I mean, it should certainly be an option. Um, I, I wouldn't, um, whether it should be compulsory, yeah, not quite sure. Um, I mean, Maybe it should be an I, aspect of the math syllabus. Yes, maybe some of the mathematics uh, curriculum should be devoted to kind of ideas about computation as well. Yeah, because there's certainly very mathematical aspects to it. So yeah, I think that would be one option. Mike says, could the NP versus P problem just be an unsolvable question equivalent to that about how many angels can dance on the head of a pin? <laughs> well, that, that's great. I mean, I'm not quite sure about that equivalence, but it's, it's quite possible that the NP versus P problem can just not be solved using the axioms of mathematics as we know them. And in fact, some of my own work kind of connects to that, trying to show that um, using certain fragments of kind of mathematics that we can't actually settle the NP versus P question based on that. Um, and it's possibly that has been considered by others, uh, given that it seems so difficult. 
Um, and there's sort of like a self-referential nature to the problem, which um, makes yeah. one imagine that something like Gödel's incompleteness theorem could be connected to it. Um, so yeah, that's that's certainly intriguing. I mean, um, yeah, we would hope uh, to kind of gain some understanding of it and that there's an actual mathematical proof of it, but certainly the possibility that it um, requires some very new kind of mathematical techniques or even axioms. So uh, Tim, uh, who's 11 and says he's enjoying this, uh, says, why can't normal computers do things as fast as quantum computers? Um, so the easiest way to explain that is just that they're kind of like um, um, constrained to act locally, right? So this is in response to um, Dino to your question earlier. So um, like with the game of life, each cell only evolves based on its neighbors. Um, mm -hmm. With quantum computing, you have non-local phenomena. So there's like action at a, what's so called action at a distance. And that enables some greater computational power. And you can exploit these kinds of effects to solve certain problems quicker, such as searching a list quicker or solving the factoring problem in polynomial time, which we don't know how to do in a classical computer and believe can't be done. And uh, a question from an anonymous uh, attendee who says, thanks for the talk. I'm particularly concerned about the misuse of technology in politics and global power dynamics, cold information wars, social media bots spreading propaganda and or astroturfing and so on. Do you think there's any way to regulate this or do you see it uh, continuing to snowball? That, that's also a question that I must say I find absolutely fascinating. Yeah, I think it's very important to regulate it and it's very important to kind of take it very seriously. I mean, it's a very urgent question because it has dramatic consequences for our world, right? I mean, um, we think of like technological advances as having dramatic consequences. Of course, it's great that we have COVID vaccines, but um, um, it, it could also be like terrible for us if we have dictatorships all over the world. I mean, there's very, these are very different kinds of phenomena um, and we can't use kind of one framework to understand them all. Um, so I certainly do believe that, um, yeah, I mean, that the, the, there should be more regulation and kind of we should be aware of the, um, of the, the risks of technology. Um, I mean, it, but isn't it, the regulation is, is extraordinarily difficult because you're talking about an inherently global phenomenon uh, used in many cases by people who are anonymous or extraordinarily difficult to track down and where people can simply slip from one computer to another in, in the flash of an eye. How do you regulate that? Yes, I mean, exactly. The power of the internet, which means that we're all connected. And uh, I mean, it kind of like has changed our lives. It can also kind of uh, make it easier to, to avoid regulation. Yeah. So there's often these kind of like um, flip sides, right? So a computational discovery or innovation that enables kind of um, positive change in the world can also be used somehow against um, uh, um, uh, against us. So um, we need to be aware of both sides, I think. Um, um, but it's a, it's a very complex question for sure. Yeah, but it's certainly one that's very urgent. Uh, actually, one, one more point I wanna make about that is that yeah. I think one of the, the most um, sort of like um, problematic source of inequity in the world is that between those who are technologically aware and kind of like, um, and understand these issues and those who are not. And I think that's like, in terms of haves versus have nots, I mean, there's, there's of course the standard measures, but information and kind of like familiarity with technology, I think that's a major one. And I think there's sort of a great need also to try to remedy that because that also leads to a sort of political kind of instability mm -hmm. that we've seen elsewhere in the world now. So uh, just one last question before, before we break. Uh, this is from Carl Ledecker. How do you see the future developing in terms of the integration of humans and computers? Do you see computers being embedded in humans in the quite near future? Mm, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, yeah, I mean, that's also um, kind of an interesting question. Um, I mean, we can like certainly romance. imagine uh, like medical devices um, that mm -hmm. have like significant computational power being embedded in us. And um, I mean, there's Google Glass. Oh, brain enhancers. Oh, brain enhancers, yeah, yeah. There's all kinds of like, I mean, yeah, so perhaps we sort of like intermediate, like, uh, like cyborgs, kind of hybrids between humans and computers mm -hmm. that we can imagine. Um, yeah, and also for um, people who are paralyzed, if you could, um, you know, ha have something that was uh, connected to your brain so that if you thought about moving a limb, uh, you know, a, um, a robot limb would move for you and you'd be effectively be able to, re to, to control your own, um, computer controlled body through the power of thought. Is that, is that realistic? I mean, that's plausible. I mean, that's again, kind of advances in robotics and kind of like some are combining like um, kind of algorithms with um, like um, 
the procedures for kind of moving kind of uh, physical parts around and sensing and kind of things like that. Yeah. Thank you so much, Rahul. You, you've given us a glimpse um, into a world of enormous power and possibility, but also uh, of great dangers. Um, and it's been absolutely thrilling, uh, brilliant taster. And thank you so much for engaging with everybody's questions. Um, I, I'm sure everybody on this uh, webinar has found it as fascinating as I have. Thank you so much. Yeah, and thanks. thank you to everybody uh, for attending. It's lovely to uh, have your questions and uh, particularly to see uh, teenagers engaging actively with this. Thank you all so very much. And I hope to see you all again very soon. Thank you. Good night.